Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Stephen Reimer. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI, and I'm going to be chairing today's event. So a very, very warm welcome to everybody. Before we begin, I just want to cover a few guidelines for the webinar, um, although I'm sure many of these points are now second nature to everybody. Bit of a preview on this slide that was just on before I popped on the screen. Um, importantly, please note that the full webinar, including the question and answer period, is going to be recorded and then published to the RUSI website, uh, including the question and answer period. So please be uh, conscious, of, conscious, conscious of that while you're asking your questions. Um, the recording will also be published to um, or turned into a future episode of the CFCS's Financial Crime Insights podcast. And we do encourage audience participation throughout the webinar. So please make sure to um, submit any questions that you may have for our guest through the Zoom question and answer function. And when submitting your questions, you're invited to also include your organizational affiliation. So we know a little bit more about you and about your question. So now that we have that out of the way, again, very warm welcome to everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm really looking forward to hosting this, um, this, this session on, on, on terrorism financing, which I feel is a really fickle field of, of research. I've personally spent around two years at the CFCS looking almost exclusively at this topic. And then there's some days where I ask myself if any of us really have a clue where terrorism financing risk is, what the best approaches are, and how to counter it. The counterterrorism financing regime feels a lot like the scrappy younger brother of the anti-money laundering regime who has given their older siblings ill-fitting hand-me-downs. And then it's our job as financial crime researchers to somehow figure out how to make that adopted regime really work for this entirely different security threat. But lucky for all of us in the terrorism financing research world, somebody has come along and done what I think is a very fine job of pulling together those existing strands of TF research has been able to assess where the field stands today. But this work is not a, simply a stock take. It's, um, it's so much more. What I, what I really like about this book is that it's committed to really getting specific about categorizing behaviors, including what we mean when we say terrorism financing. What is financing? What is it for? What does it look like? And what, what other sorts of behaviors or activities wrongly get swept up in the mix when we talk about terrorism finance? And I think that the field is really going to benefit greatly analytical concepts and other ideas presented in this book. And I hope that that will ideally have an effect on clarifying risk and steering practitioners towards more optimal counterterrorism financing responses. Um, I think that sharpening of language has also allowed our author to clarify, clarify for us some new concepts and ideas as well. And I hope that those become more commonplace in the study of terrorism financing. I certainly look forward to including some of those concepts and ideas in my own work. With me to discuss this book entitled Illicit Money, Financing Terrorism in the 21st Century is CFCS Associate Fellow Jessica Davis. Jessica is President and Principal Consultant at Insight Threat Intelligence in Ottawa, having previously served as Senior Strategic Analyst at the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. She is a PhD candidate at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, and when she's not doing all of that, she is also the president of the Canadian Association of Security and Intelligence Studies. Her first book, entitled Women in Modern Terrorism, was published in 2017. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thanks so much for having me, Stephen. Um, for the information of our audience, Jessica and I are going to have a conversation for around the next 30 minutes or so to discuss her book as well as the questions that it, it seeks to answer and the questions that it poses. Um, but if anybody would like to pose their questions as they come to them, you can put those into the Q&A box. We will get around to those when we open up for open question and answer. Uh, so to get us started, Jessica, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, why you wanted to write this book on terrorism finance? Well, thank you so much, first of all, for that very kind introduction. Uh, you really nailed a lot of the things that I was trying to do with the book in, in that introduction. And I also want to say, too, that it's so nice to see so many familiar faces uh, and names in the, in the attendees list. It's uh, a nice bit of community we've got going on in, in the room right now. So I really wanted to write this book because there were there's a lot that's been written about terrorist financing. It's 
but it's all sort of disparate. So it's, you know, there's a couple of really good books on maybe particular groups. There's a couple of good overarching books that are now maybe a little bit dated. And there have been a lot of changes over the last 20 years in terms of how we think about terrorist financing, how we go about countering it. So I wanted to, first of all, bring it all together under sort of one umbrella and do a bit of a stock taking of what we know, what we think we know, because sometimes those are not the same things. Um, and really get a sense from there. And then I really wanted to present an analytic framework that I've actually been using for a number of years in my work, um, which is this whole conceptualization of financing as how terrorists raise, use, move, store, manage, and obscure their funds. Most of the work on terrorist financing will focus on a few of those aspects, um, but I believe this is the first time all, all, all six of those are really coming together in one space. And I think that that's an important way for both researchers to think about terrorist financing so that we're not forgetting about particular aspects of it, but also for practitioners to sort of see the different possibilities in terms of detecting and disrupting terrorist financing. Mm -hmm. I'm interested about the analytical framework that you've said that you, you've had, you know, you've been using personally for, for a long time. Um, how did you come up with that sort of analytical framework in, in the course of your work, the one that you now want to put on the page with, with your book? So this doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, there has been a lot of work that's been done, and I'm building on a lot of that work over the that's been done over the last you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, so I started off by really looking at all of the what's been written, both in terms of from the Financial Action Task Force, from financial intelligence units, from researchers. Um, and, I, and I sort of looked at that and I thought, you know, there's some things that are missing here um, in terms of how we're looking at this holistically. And that really came about through some of the investigative work that I was involved in in Canada, looking at the concrete activities that a lot of terrorist actors are undertaking and then trying to map it to those existing frameworks. There were some aspects that fell through the cracks. So that's why I sort of developed this, this a bit more expanded framework to make it a bit more concrete. And also I really wanted to use consistent language in all of my writing, because as you know, as many people in this room know, terrorist financing can become a pretty technical topic very quickly. And by using consistent language throughout, I think it makes it easier for policymakers to really understand, especially when they're just jumping into the topic, maybe once every two or three months, or even just once or twice a year, um, you know, making sure that they're building sort of an analytic framework of understanding through our briefings and through our writing, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit more about, you know, at the CFCS, we're often in that kind of policy um, operational space, as, as you've just described, and in our research, that's often the audience that we're trying to target. But I, I felt that your book really kind of let us sit back and kind of study this concept a lot more academically. So I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the state of like the academic literature um, that you've alluded to. You said it's a little bit disparate and maybe dated in some places. Um, what, did, what does the literature look like um, at the moment? Yeah, I would say that it's a bit of a mix. There's a number of really good foundational studies that exist out there. You know, Jody Vittori, Colin Clark have both done really great pieces of work. And I, I, I know that by name dropping them, I'm now for getting other really important contributions in the field. But you know, there's a bit in the introduction of, the, of my book about sort of where I think the major contributions have been made. But you know, the terrorist financing field does move forward fairly quickly. Um, so there's been some developments in the field since those, those works were written. The field, the academic literature, I would say, you know, it's there, there just really hasn't been that one piece of work that's brought everything together, which is one, one of the things that I really wanted to do here. Um, and that's been to the detriment because there's not really been a lot of theory building that's been going on in, in terrorist financing. So to a certain extent, this, this book is both a descriptive theory. So how, how I think or how we can sort of see terrorist financing happen and a normative one. So it's supposed to also help predict how terrorist actors will finance their activities in the future. So while I do say that, you know, the terrorist financing field has changed quite a lot over the last 20 years, there's actually quite a lot of similarities over time as well. So some of the basic mechanisms don't change over time, no matter what the, ter the technologies look like, no matter what terrorist group or type of actor that we're looking at, those uh, uh, underlying or fundamental mechanisms stay the same. 
The other thing that I do want to mention here, you know, a lot of the really good literature on terrorist financing and counter-terrorist financing does not come out of academic research. It comes from think tanks. It comes from financial intelligence units. And I think this is where one of the challenges in the field has really come in terms of terrorist financing as an academic study, because, you know, when we think about scholarly work and most literature reviews will focus on scholarly work, that doesn't work in the terrorist financing space. You really have to include those think tank reports, those, you know, national level or sometimes international level research and analyses, because that's where we're advancing some of these concepts. The thing that's interesting about terrorist financing, though, and and particularly from the place that I sit in, is that I think of it uh, in terms of research on it as a very collaborative and and a bit of a partnership in terms of that research. You know, this is while I did all this work to pull it all together, there's so many pieces that I'm standing on to make this book work. Um, And I hopefully that's reflected well, both in the introduction and in, in the references. But you know, we have to be really collaborating between the, the academic side of things and the practitioner side of things to advance this knowledge. Mm-hmm. I mean, as a person who studies terrorism financing in a think tank, I completely agree with you. The collaborative nature is important just because the most up-to-date information and source data is sometimes not something that's publicly available. And we need to rely on our contacts with the public sector to you know, understand various threats and, and responses. Um, so in your book, going in kind of into the content now, um, you try to dispel several misconceptions. Um, when it comes to donors in particular, you talk specifically about the problem of using certain terms like diaspora remittances, um, you know, to which my mind refers to you know, funds that are being sent to terrorist groups from abroad, but under false pretenses, perhaps the idea that um, those funds are declared to be providing for family members who live in the mother country, but are actually being intended to fund terrorism. Could, could you explain this in a little bit more, a little bit more detail? Yeah, and this is, I think, one of those places where terms really matter. So I've seen a number of, you know, research articles, policy briefs that talk about the issue of diaspora remittances in terms of terrorist financing. And it's not clear what they mean because there's a number of different things that happen here. So yes, there are sometimes pockets of diaspora communities that are supportive of a terrorist group and send those money, send money to those groups. And I would say that that's not diaspora financing. That is identity-based support network financing. Um, Diaspora financing can also refer to the taxation of remittances by a terrorist organization. So here, I think the very classic example is Al-Shabaab, who we know have been taxing remittances to Somalia whenever they're in a position to do so with, they're in a position of control or influence over the Hoalas that are in their area of operation, they'll tax that activity. So they're taxing diaspora remittances. But the the term itself has been used to describe both of those activities and even, even more things. So, you know, part of what I really want to do with this book and what we've already talked about a fair bit is get really precise with our terms so that You know, I don't want to see policy briefs to different governments saying that we need to end remittances because a terrorist organization is taxing them or they're making use of that. Because while that is technically a policy option, the humanitarian impacts of that are enormous. So those are some of the places that I'm I'm really trying to make some bring some clarity to the activities that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, I really do like this thing about, you know, clarity of, of, of terms, because even between different policy communities, what one's conception might be of, you know, diaspora remittances might be really different from from another one. And then joined up responses kind of get all muddled together. You know, we would like to think that we don't have policy communities who think, well, we need to end all remittances to Somalia for risk of them falling into the hands of Al-Shabaab. I mean, this is clearly um, a consequence of of poor language choices. Um, Let's talk about something now completely differently. you know, one of the really exciting things about your book is that you, you, you take on this question of terrorism financing and the not-for-profit sector or, or NPOs, and you, you develop a typology of the seven methods by which, you know, uh, the charitable sector might be exploited for terrorism financing purposes. And I'm just curious, you know, why was it important for you to consider the not-for- not-for-profit sector in this way? And, you know, how do you think that typology has, has practical impact? Mm. This was another, I guess, I guess this book you could kind of say is like almost a compilation of the things that have annoyed me about terrorist financing (laughs) for the last 10 years. So this is another one that I find so deeply frustrating. So, 
we'll often see very high level statements about the exploitation of the charitable sector and the nonprofit sector for terrorist financing. But when you start to try to dig into the actual activities that are happening, the connections, the links, the associations can sometimes fall apart very quickly. Or, you know, an entire nonprofit or charitable organization will be characterized as a terrorist front. And that's not true. Most of the time, it's one person who's in a position of control or influence who has been diverting funds from the NPO. So in creating this typology, I really wanted to articulate the very specific ways that I've seen terrorist financing happen through the nonprofit and charitable sector. And so that starts with an organization that is a complete and total terrorist front is established by a terrorist organization. These are very rare. And it sort of trickles all the way down through individuals in a position of control or influence and how the donors may or may not know where their funds are going to loan actors or small cells who use a charitable front to collect a small amount of funds from their friends, family, from the public. Um, so they're really just using a charitable cause as um, a part of their, their terrorist financing activities. So when we talk about terrorist financing through charities, I think it's really important to try to be as specific as we can be about who's the problem, where that problem lies, and because that really speaks to the policy response. So if we have a big problem with ter terrorists uh, establishing charitable organizations as fronts, that speaks to a really different policy response than individuals who use a charitable cause as a, as a front for raising funds. The policy response is hugely different. One is like very heavy on the regulatory side. The other is much heavier on the investigative side. So I think having that precision of language, that precision of understanding is critical for informing both national and international level uh, norms and regulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the NPO story around terrorism financing for some people who are maybe more familiar with it than others, this will be no surprise has gone undergone like a real journey, you know, with with FATF kind of changing its its methodology and its recommendation eight around terrorism financing abuse abuse of, of the not for profit sector. And yet, you know, in some of the work we do at, at the CFCS, we we encounter that kind of classic or very like old fashioned kind of understanding of you know NPOs are high risk for terrorism finance, and therefore we can justify you know really aggressive kind of regulation or clampdowns. Um, but I want to ask you. Recommendation eight from FATF. It now, there, it, the, the official line from FATF is that not all NPOs are high risk, and some may represent uh, little or no risk at all. And I was wondering, you know, given the research that you've done, um, do you think FATF's assessment is sort of in line with 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 your own in terms of uh, the scale of charitable abuse? I know we're talking kind of worldwide here, but but you, you provide some figures in your book that twenty percent of organizations, terrorist organizations, you studied. Have exploited charities at one point or another, but that two percent of terrorist plots have been involved with at least some form of finance from from charitable abuse. So, could you kind of help us to understand those statistics and the fact of understanding as to where we stand with this this whole charity business? Yeah. So the statistics that are in this book, I think, are best understood first of all as a bit of a snapshot in time. So, I was quite disappointed with how we quantify terrorist financing in the literature and even in, in policy and think tank documents. I think that that's been something that we've been a little sloppy about. Um, so I really wanted to try to put some concrete numbers around things, but it is just a snapshot. So I looked at 50 terrorist organizations and a relatively equal number of plots and attacks that have been either completed or disrupted to come up with those figures. Those, but those case, those sort of mini case studies span probably the better part of 30 years. So while we're talking about those numbers, it's really important to keep in mind that it's not today. That's not what's happening here and now. That's sort of what's happened over time and within that sample of about 50 to 100, depending on how you're thinking about it. But at the same time, I do think that it starts to help us characterize exactly what we're talking about in terms of terrorist exploitation of these organizations. Um, I do think that the FATF recommendation eight has been um, it does better reflect the risk. I still think that there's a lot of room for precision though here. And this is part of what we're trying, what I'm trying to do with this typology, because I think that what most charities and nonprofit organizations really need to know is that 
they get abused or exploited when they have poor financial and management controls. That's sort of the number one way that that happens. I mean, I can't really advise them if they're a, t- a terrorist front. I can't really do anything about that. They're probably not coming to me for advice or, or guidance, hopefully. <laughs> on that. Yeah, right. Eh? Um, but for the ones that are you know, operating in jurisdictions or with partners in jurisdictions that are at risk of terrorist exploitation, which, to be fair, I think is actually most terrorist, most jurisdictions now, because most of us actually have some sort of terrorist activity. Some of it's higher, obviously, than others. But It is a reality for most countries now. Um, Understanding what those risks are and how they can mitigate or prevent their abuse. And it really just starts with that fundamental financial controls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's a good, I think, reminder, especially for the NPO story that, uh, you know, improving CTF outcomes when it comes to the NPO sector, it's not always about a new law or like a new regulation from the government. It can be about in, in, you know, supporting the sector to increase its own or enhance its own kind of, you know, internal financial controls. Um, and I also agree with you about kind of quantifying the extent of terrorism financing. It's very frustrating to read things that say, well, this, this, this amount of dollars, like more dollars does not equal more terrorism in that sense. And that's, again, I think one of those relics of the anti-money laundering, uh, crossover that we have, which isn't very helpful in describing terrorism. Um, but, 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 but across your book, I think like one of the, one of the biggest contributions that you're making is that you, you identify you know, a few financing mechanisms um, that most other typologies of terror, um, that you, you identify new kind of financing uh, mechanisms um, in, in your work. You kind of go beyond the raise, move, uh, use and store typology, and then you include manage and obscure. And this is you know, very innovative and very interesting for us uh, terrorism financing people. Why did you want to include these? And uh, why do you think these, um, these, these pieces, manage and obscure, are, are important? The management of terrorist funds is interesting both at the organizational and operational level. So the other piece that we haven't talked about yet in, in the book that I'm trying to really emphasize is the differentiation between understanding how a terrorist group or organization finances itself and how an attack or plot is financed. I'm obviously not the first one to make this differentiation. This is something that exists in the literature, but I don't think it's been emphasized enough. And I think going forward, this is the kind of thing that I'd like to see in every piece of research is really making the distinction. Are we talking about organizational financing or are we talking about the operational piece or both? And so when we talk about management of funds, I think this is such an interesting distinction between organizations and operations. Organizationally, if any terrorist organization has a surplus of funds, they need to manage that money. They need to make investments. They need to figure out where to hide it. They need to understand, like, especially when the, those that are planning for their future. So classic examples here would be the Islamic State. Um, you know, they were able to generate huge amounts of money through taxation, through oil, through tra- uh, trafficking of antiquities, etc. So they had to manage that money. How did they do it? They had individuals who were um, financial managers. They divided it down regionally. And the same is true, actually, in ISIL in Afghanistan right now, too. They have sort of seller regional operational managers. This, of course, presents opportunities for disruption and detection, um, certainly as maybe targets of financial in- of intelligence collection. Um, sometimes, depending on the conflict, we've seen financial managers targeted through kinetic strikes. So there's lots of different opportunities if you understand how a group is managing its funds. And then, of course, like how that how they're using it and doing all of the other things with it on the operational side. This is also one of those things that I find so interesting. So even when we think about small cells or lone actors or sorry, uh, self-activating individuals as in the Rusi context, um, these plots and attacks all have financial managers. Sometimes it's the leader of the plot. If it's a lone actor, they're often the individual who's obviously managing the funds for their own plot. But there's specific activities that they undertake through that management process. A really an example that's close to my heart was the Toronto 18 plot. There was one individual, this was a disrupted plot in Canada back in the 2000s. For anybody who doesn't know, there was a plan to... Um, conduct an improvised explosive device and and detonated in downtown Toronto. There was also a subplot um, that I'll I'll leave out for now just for the sake of brevity. But one of the main individuals involved in this plot 
manage the funds for the entire group. So he set the budget, he established how he was going to do procurement activities. He stored the money in different ways. He created the operational security plan around it. So these are all really critical aspects to explore when we're under, looking to understand the financing of plots and attacks. And then for lone actors or even small cells, when you understand the management, you understand how terrorists first aspire generally to a large scale complex attack, and they have to downscale their activities as they encounter those logistical hurdles. So when they realize that they can't actually acquire all the material or the money that they need for their attacks and plots, they then shift to a more simplistic attack with lower financial requirements. Um, and so that's sort of a broad strokes part of the importance of understanding the management piece from the obscuring side of things, you know, it's just, it's really about that financial trade craft. How are terrorist actors, cells, individuals, and organizations seeking to hide the source and destination of their funds? This is not generally as complicated as we see in the money laundering world or even in the sanctions evasion space. Most of the time, terrorist actors are using more simple means. Cash remains absolutely critical. I call it the uh, financial intelligence black hole because you know once we're talking about cash, it becomes very difficult to use any kind of financial intelligence uh, collection techniques against that. It's, you used to have to start to rely on other investigative tools to, to, to track the source and destination of funds. Um, but cash couriers and block and certainly Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and other financial technologies are all ways that terrorist actors are seeking to hide the source and destination of funds. But there is so much more that we can unpack on, on the financial tradecraft side that's super interesting, I think, and probably still understudied, even though I do try to do a justice to it in my book. There's probably a lot more we can do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like thinking about these these concepts as well. Um, because I mean, you were just talking about Bitcoin, and in the in this part in this part of the book where you're talking about obscuring uh, funds, you discuss you know sort of Bitcoin transactions and you know fundraising of of uh, of, of terrorist funds you know via Bitcoin. I'd never really kind of considered it the sort of ter terrorism financing and cryptocurrency piece as an obfuscation tactic, but more as just like a method that's more available or more open for for terrorist groups to sort of um, solicit donations from uh, from from potential. Followers. So again, thinking about manage and obscure, I think helps us to uh, tease a bit more out of behaviors and, and kind of phenomena that we see. So I'm very grateful for those. Thank you. Um, let's talk about, we talked a lot about terrorism financing. Let's talk about counterterrorism financing just for a little bit um, before we go to question and answer uh, quite soon. What do you think about the kind of current CTF uh, counterterrorism financing approaches that we have, and are those aligned with, uh, with the known financing mechanisms that you've outlined in your book? I think the problem that we have in counter-terrorist financing right now, and, and part of what I'm trying to correct here, is that we think about counter-terrorist financing policies and practices um, very separately. So if you talk to a bank, they're going to talk about the CTF in terms of regulations, mandatory reporting, suspicious transaction, or suspicious matter reporting. If you talk to somebody in the military, they may, if they if they think about it at all, think about it in terms of kinetic strikes, um, capture kill missions, that kind of thing. But really, we're talking about a wide variety of different activities. So we've got sanctions, of course, uh, sort of financial exclusion. We've got regulatory, the private sector uh, monitoring. There's a financial intelligence approach. And so we really need to think about all of these as part of one big package of counter-terrorist financing activities. The problem that we have in terms of CTF right now is that we have really no good idea if any of these are working. So <laughs> this is a subject of my dissertation, so I won't get into it too, too much. But because we haven't categorized and characterized counter-terrorist financing as specifically as we need to, and sort of instead thought about it in these very disparate terms, we have managed to only evaluate, if we have evaluated any of them at all, in these very specific silos. So we don't really have a good sense of our overall approach to counter-terrorist financing works, and if it works, what specifically of those different buckets of counter-terrorist financing activities get the most bang for the buck, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the issue. And I think the other part that's very clear to me is that a lot of our counter-terrorist financing policies, particularly at the international level, and maybe to a certain extent um, in different juris national jurisdictions, were brought in clearly after 
and we're a little bit of a catch-all for basically illicit financing activities to try to counter illicit financing activities writ large through legislation and regulations that couldn't be passed at another time. So they may not have targeted known activities, known terrorist financing activities at all. They were meant to just sort of fill holes that regulators knew existed, that they didn't have the political capital to fill ahead of time. So I think we're really at the stage right now where we need to be taking a critical look at terrorist financing methods and mechanisms and tying, trying to draw those very specifically to counter terrorist financing policies and practices and figuring out where the gaps are, because I think there's quite a lot of those gaps and maybe some regulations that have less to do with counter-terrorist financing. They may be useful from an anti-money laundering perspective, but selling them as counter-terrorist financing is maybe a little disingenuous. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we have some some questions in, in the Q&A already that are touching on exactly that that piece. Um, you're making quite a splash with these, with these remarks, Jess, and I'm sure there's some in the private sector that are a bit worried that we're going to have to sort of, you know, come up with a completely different set of, kind of responses or regulations for for terrorism finance. But um, one thing I wanted to touch on uh, before we kind of move to the end of our discussion is about, um, you talk about financial data in, in, in your book uh, and how this is different from financial intelligence. I was wondering if you could sort of stipulate or make that stipulation for us a little bit clearer. And is there a way in which financial data can become financial intelligence, which can be used for um, you know um, counterterrorism financing investigations, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yes, another thing that drives me crazy, <laughs> the con conflation of data and intelligence. So I would say that banks, mandatory reporters don't generally have financial intelligence, they have financial data. It becomes financial intelligence when it's contextualized and analyzed. Sometimes that happens through suspicious transaction or suspicious matter reports. I've read some in my day that you know are incorporating a ton of different open source material, um, information from designation lists, et cetera. And that, and that to me is financial intelligence when you have that context. But mandatory reporting isn't financial intelligence until it gets that context and analysis around it. So for instance, at FinTrack, we would often talk about financial intelligence as being all of the mandatory reports that we got, including large cash transaction reports, international and electronic funds transfers. I didn't find it useful from an intelligence perspective until we actually went in and said, okay, what, what are we looking at? What are the suspicious transactions around this? What are the jurisdictional concerns around this? And so you can transform financial data, obviously, into financial intelligence through that analytic process. The other thing that I think is really important to mention about financial intelligence is that it doesn't just come from banks doesn't just come from money service businesses or financial technology companies that are reporting it. It comes through a wide variety of different collection mechanisms. So I've seen really excellent financial intelligence collected through human sources, for instance. You can, you can task your human sources to collect that kind of information. I've seen it come through uh, pocket litter, through refuse collection, through signals intelligence. All of these different kinds of collection platforms, if you will, can be purveyors of financial intelligence. Um, I think the difficulty here is that people often don't know what they're looking at, and they think that the receipt from the 7-Eleven, the Walmart, isn't useful until, and it isn't, until you have the context of an investigation or the context of um, a terrorist incident to really bring that piece of financial data into the intelligence space. So I think that we really need to start pushing the boundaries of what we think in term, about in terms of financial intelligence. And we also need to be clear when we're talking about financial data versus financial intelligence. I mean, that's really fascinating, Jess. And uh, clearly you come from CSIS, the Canadian Intelligence Service. This is uh, some of your background. So to wrap up our, our conversation, I want to ask you sort of a double-barreled question. Overall, where do you sort of see the future of terrorism financing go going forward? And, and, and what do you think our CTF practices need to do or how they need to be you know, reformed to combat terrorism financing in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. I think that it's important to remember that terrorist financing happens within our societies and our cultures, our economic systems and our financial systems. So any changes that occur in the terrorist financing space are going to be things that we are already seeing in our financial and economic systems. So 
the trends are fairly obvious there, I think. So I think with greater financial inclusion in the formal financial sector, we'll see increased use of the formal sector for terrorist financing is already the number one. I don't think that's going away any, anytime soon. Financial technologies are, of course, very important. Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, other kinds of funds transfer mechanisms are increasingly common in many different parts of the world, even in parts of the world where you don't have a lot of formal sector inclusion, financial technologies are kind of leapfrogging that inclusion, kind of like um, in parts of Eastern Africa, where there were no like landlines laid, and instead you just saw widespread adoption of cell phones. Same thing, we may not see the, the firm development of a formal financial sector in a lot of countries, but we will see um, further adoption of financial technologies through 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 cellular technology, and th- we're going to see those same trends reflected in the terrorist financing landscape. There's there's no question for me in that sense. So in terms of counter terrorist financing, we really need to be again broadening our concept of who can detect and help disrupt this activity. We have relied on banks, financial institutions, mandatory reporters for a number of years to help detect and the, the, the financial activities. But those financial activities are now increasingly happening on social media platforms, through messaging apps, through crowdfunding, which I know you know a fair bit about. Um, so these are the kinds of companies that we need to be bringing into the counter-terrorist financing fold increasingly. I don't necessarily want to put a firm Um, lying down in terms of whether that means more regulations, because again, I'm not entirely confident that the regulations have had the desired outcomes. I think that's still an open question, but it is the kind of conversations that we need to be having about counter-terrorist financing. You know, who are really actors in this space in terms of detecting and disrupting it? I mean, lots of great reasons to uh, to have a look at the book and to go into all these things in more detail. Um, Jessica, thanks so much for walking us through those key points. Um, of the book. We've got lots of great questions in the Q&A already, which I'll try to fire as many of them at you as possible okay. in, the, in the time that remains. I think we'll start with the question that's been most upvoted, um, just happens to be um, Rusi Associate Fellow and my co-author, Mr. Matthew Redhead, which is asking again about this AML and CTF kind of conflation issue. Uh, Matthew asks, the private industry usually talks about CTF in the same breadth as AML. Uh, as if they are one and the same, which seems to imply that if you look after the latter, you will deal with the former. What is your assessment of that attitude and how do you see the obligated private sector as managing CTF risks? Mm-hmm. It's a tough one. Thanks for that. <laughs> I think there, there's, there's a bit of a difficult conversation that we have to have around AML CFT in terms of regulations. So I think that the terrorist financing practices or activities will generally be caught, well, can be caught through a lot of the mandatory reporting, but AML really relies on big data to create algorithms, rules, detection activity for, you know, large scale frauds, unusual activities. And I think that works kind pretty well in terms of being able to develop those typologies or those, those identify, excuse me, identify grounds for suspicion in the money laundering space because you're dealing with data at scale. The terrorist financing space is a different problem. We're dealing really here with a bespoke data issue. So most countries, thankfully, do not get, do not have such a terrorism problem that they end up with big data around terrorist financing. So making rules and developing algorithms to detect terrorist financing doesn't generally work. I think the closest most of us have ever come is when we had hundreds of individuals leaving from a lot of Western countries to join the Islamic State. Then we had sort of a sufficient data set from which we could start to to very carefully create um, algorithms and patterns of activity. But the other piece of it too is that the activity looks different in every jurisdiction because of the unique nature of the economy and financial system. So how terrorist actors go about financing their activities looks very different. So it's, you know, you can't just apply rules that are developed in one country to your systems in another one, because there's going to be different fund mechanisms, fund movement mechanisms, different practices that are used. You know, you may have a much more cash-based society, or you may use a particular type of financial technology that's not available anywhere else. So these are all things that make applying the AML model to counter-terrorist financing really, really difficult. 
The other thing that I'll say here is that the best counter-terrorist financing information or best financial intelligence I've ever seen come from the private sector is really when there's a public-private partnership in place or intelligence sharing that's happening. Um, most of the time you really need that lead information to be able to detect changes in behavior, chat, changes in patterns of activity that are realistic, that realistically refer to terrorist financing activity. Otherwise, you're really generating a ton of false positives. That can be useful if you're operating in a high-risk jurisdiction and you need to be applying that level of due diligence and you're going to be moving your staff to be doing that kind of thing. You can do geographic ring fencing, then start to sort of narrow down the, the financial activities from there. But for the most part, if you were to, if, if a financial institution were to report all of the activities that they conceived of as terrorist financing based on the typologies and indicators that are out there, you would inundate a financial intelligence unit or a law enforcement unit with false positives. Mm -hmm. And in some places we see that being the case with other types of financial crime, lots of uh, suspicious activity reports remaining unactioned because of the sheer quantity. Um, it, is, it is difficult in that respect. Um, Mikey Morton has a question. Uh, and he says, do you see any stark differences um, between how uh, far-right terrorist groups and uh, Islamist extremist-related terrorist organizations exploit the NPO or the charity sector in particular, or does their exploitation occur in much the same way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I love this question, and I love the, specific, the specificity on the NPO sector. So I'm going to answer it two ways. First of all, I would say that the exploitations are still the same, but the level of suspicion is really different. So, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but there has been a lot of suspicion cast around Muslim charities because of the connections to, or the alleged connections in a lot of cases to um, terrorist organizations. So there's been a level of enhanced due diligence around a lot of them. There are certainly harms around that, that I, I don't want to gloss over. I don't think that that's been a good practice, but that's sort of been the practice. And I think that those suspicions haven't been turned very effectively onto ideologically motivated violent extremists, the right-wing extremists who may be operating charities because they don't fit the same sort of risk profile that countries have established to deal with our jihadist terrorist problem, rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly in, in most cases. So I think that the level, the, the, the lens of suspicion hasn't been turned appropriately to those charities, but I'm also reluctant to sort of argue for that approach with right-wing extremism because of the harms that it, we, we've seen that have developed um, against Muslim, Muslim charities. So I don't necessarily wanna move the harms from one approach on from one group to another, um, but there is a disparity in how we do that. And then when we talk about financing and the right wing and right wing extremism more generally, again, I would say that it's very consistent. You know, the financing mechanisms are very similar from group and ideology to group to ideology, but the right wing extremism and particularly anti government extremists do have an ideological propensity to adopt cryptocurrencies and particularly Bitcoin because they have a natural inclination towards avoiding trappings of the state. So they're, since they're anti-government extremists, they're trying to move away from that and using a funds movement mechanism or a currency that isn't state backed is aligned with their ideology. And so they have more enthusiasm for, um, for that than I've seen with other, with other groups and organizations. So those are the two sort of differences. And when I think about right-wing extremism and, and terrorist financing, I sometimes think about it as like the, the Venn diagram between the, the Bitcoin bros who are so excited about, uh, about Bitcoin and then the right-wing extremism. And there is a bit of an overlap there. And, and so that's where that's, that enthusiasm is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you often wonder, are far-right groups adopting cryptocurrency because it helps them meet their aims more quickly or more generally or more efficiently? Or is it that uh, uh, they're more ideologically aligned with the concept around you know, decentralized finance? It's probably a bit of both, as you, as you say. Um, kind of talking about, you mentioned kind of terrorism versus extremism a little bit. And our next question from Ross Savage sort of on that, on that distinction. Uh, Ross says, I'm interested in your observations concerning the legislative differences between extremism and terrorism. 
uh, you know, across different jurisdictions and, and, and how this might impact or frustrate the private sector as, as, as they try to implement mitigating measures to, to identify and detect and kind of prevent uh, extremist or, or, or terrorist financing. So we, so we have two pieces. Right? The extremism versus terrorism the distinction, which I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll talk about, and then the sort of different jurisdictions holding different classifications and what the private sector is kind of meant to do in that, in that space of being told different things by different people. Yeah, this is this is a very um, challenging space. So, and it is also again another thing that drives me a little bit crazy. So we sometimes conflate extremism and terrorism. These are very different concepts in my mind. So terrorism is really about taking action on extremist ideas. You can be an extremist in many jurisdictions around the world, and that is not a crime. Um, and there's extremism across the political spectrum. So you could be a left wing extremist. You can be a right wing extremist. You could be a very like sort of um, issue based extremist. And maybe that gets you on the monitoring by security services. But most of the time, you're not going to be charged with a criminal act crim with a crime because you haven't taken action on those ideas. The problem then becomes when you start to see individuals trying to move from the extremism space to the terrorism space, so taking action on their extremist ideas. Um, terrorist financing, of course, is very specific in terms of the actions and activities. Most countries um, really focus on that. There are some sort of propaganda um, rules. Most of them don't touch on the financing piece quite so much. But it is a difficult space. And I think the most difficult piece of it is the reputational risk for financial institutions. So I think if we look, think about the Proud Boys in Canada, that's a really um, illustrative example. So for the Proud Boys for a long time in Canada, we're not considered to be a terrorist organization. Definitely, I would say an extremist group or extremist organization, but banks don't have any sort of regulatory requirement to be monitoring that. And I think that there's also a conversation that needs to be had about whether or not the private sector in, a, in banks or social media companies, what their role is in that. And, you know, that's the broader social media conversation that I, I think that we can probably leave to the side for today. Um, but then suddenly Canada decided to list the Proud Boys and financial institutions across the country were left with accounts of individuals who had been publicly identified as Proud Boys members. And so they had to take immediate action to figure out could any of the provision of financial services constitute terrorist financing? What were their reputational risks? Uh, most of them, from the conversations that I've had with them, have decided to debank or de-risk those accounts. So um, ask those, those clients to find alternative banking arrangements. Um, but the change happens really suddenly. And you know, I'm not entirely sure, first of all, what the outcome will be for a lot of those individuals and what the utility of it is. So certainly we don't necessarily want to have our financial institutions used for terrorist financing purposes, but do we want to also debank a bunch of citizens of our country and potentially risk enhancing their um, societal isolation that way. So there's a lot of considerations and I don't really have a great answer for this issue other than I'm sympathetic to the reputational risk issue that many financial institutions are facing in this space. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, who is really served by that uh, deep, not so much deplatforming, but that kind of de-risking of those clients um, if it's unclear to the extent with which the extent to which those individuals use the bank accounts that they had with, with these with these with these banks to to plan or to perpetrate violent acts of terrorism. I mean, and I would also say that there's a financial intelligence perspective here too. That if you debank someone, you lose access to a reliable source of information and ultimately intelligence on their activities. If and when you have an investigation that rises to that level. Um, and banks and financial institutions, money service businesses are often very important partners in that process. So, you know, are we cutting off our nose to spite our face there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a point you made before, Jess, and I think about it sometimes. Um, so we've got a question from uh, Gerard Daly, and he's, I'm gonna editorialize his question just a little bit. Um, Gerard asks, you know, how do you see uh, CTF data? So sort of financial intelligence or financial data as, as you've described it. Um, being conjoined with, with, with other forms of intelligence, you know, whether that's information that comes from you know, the travel sector, um, ETIAS, uh, or other kind of modes of, um, 
you know, streams of data, modes of intelligence, in order to increase, um, you know, sort of counterterrorism financing objectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really bad at that. <laughs> I think uh, financial intelligence is a technical form of intelligence. So anybody who's seen transaction reports has seen sort of that raw financial intelligence piece knows that <clears throat> when you're confronted with spreadsheets of hundreds or hundreds of thousands of transactions, it's daunting. It is horrifying. I remember the first time I went to work at FinTrack, I thought to myself, what have I done? <laughs> this isn't intelligence. This is just a spreadsheet. Um, yeah. So it is a very difficult type of intelligence to sort of combine in investigations. Like it's, you know, if you're talking about, you know, a loan actor, or a small cell of individuals with a small financial footprint, it's very easy to do that work. It's much more accessible. You know, we're talking about a couple of transactions generally, maybe a small amount over time. When you're talking about an organization, this becomes a much more daunting prospect when you've got multiple financial managers who are conducting hundreds or thousands of transactions every year and trying to figure out who and what's doing, do, who's doing what and when. Combining it with other kinds of intelligence is obviously one of the most critical things to do because most financial intelligence on its own is going to really lack that context. I think the number of times that I've seen an investigation start or advance just based on financial intelligence, I could probably count on one hand. And this includes all of my international work as well. So not just in Canada, but um, through some of the other work that I've done with a lot of other countries. So you really need that context. To, to make that happen. And the travel piece is important, um, but so are all of the other types of intelligence that you have access to. So, you know, financial intelligence on its own, useful, but it's really part of that all source approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got to find better ways to sort of streamline those, not streamline, but so much as like join up the threads. And so, you know, activity that can seem sort of innocuous in the financial intelligence can actually you know, with the context of other streams of intelligence can make that, find those financial behaviors actually look quite suspicious. Um, Neil Bennett has a question and he says that um, the agencies that know the most about terrorist activity and, and therefore presumably terrorist finance activity are in fact national intelligence agencies. So his question for you, Jessica, is do you think that intelligence agencies properly understand what counterterrorism financing is? Um, and furthermore, how do we, or will we ever know what they know in order to inform policy response typologies or academic response. So we're kind of staying on, on that level of, you know, what do, not so much what does the private sector and kind of, you know, financial intelligence units know about, you know, uh, other forms of intelligence. How much does the core intelligence agency know about CTF and how interested are they, I suppose, in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in my experience, I would say that most national intelligence organizations don't pay much attention to the financing piece. In a lot of different countries, they will assume that the financial intelligence unit is doing that, or they'll assume that maybe law enforcement is doing that. So I think the level of understanding around financial intelligence and around counter-terrorist financing is really low. I think that most of the other piece that I think is really important here is that most intelligence organizations that I've worked with or worked or, or, or had conversations with rarely think about counter-terrorist financing as a disruption opportunity. And this is really unfortunate because I think that the financing space offers a lot of, obviously not, most of the time, non-kinetic, maybe low impact disruption opportunities that can derail or frustrate an attack or plan in a way that can be quite subtle. And so not necessarily compromise the rest of the investigation or um, alert the individual that they're under surveillance or under investigation, but can just make their lives that little bit more difficult so that they either downscale their plans, like I talked about earlier, or in some cases, they kind of just abandon them because they just can't seem to get traction on their ideas and turn them into action. So I would say that broadly speaking, this is a place where most countries that I've worked with really need to improve. Um, most of the time, financial intelligence is seen as very specialized and separate, but we really need to be integrating that into our investigations, whether it's at the law enforcement level or at the, at the security organization level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a wealth of information and we've just, I suppose, have to find a way to get the folks who could do something about it, get them to have access to it and be interested in, in seeing it. 
Yeah, and, and the FATF talks about um, parallel financial investigations, and I think that that can be useful, but I actually kind of think that we need to move towards uh, integrated financial investigations. So making sure that the financial intelligence is integrated into all aspects of the investigation. Um, but the thing is, you need people who really understand that. And I don't think that that's the role for a generalist. I think that's the role for somebody who's been doing that kind of work for a number of years to really be able to pull at those threads. And so I would I would put forward that we need to be embedding financial intelligence experts into all of those types of investigations and integrating that piece in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds like a good recommendation to me. Um, we've got an- another question kind of, again, looking to the future, sort of reforming or sort of adapting the CTF uh, regime or our approach to it. Um, Matthew asks, to, you, to, to what extent do you see new technologies, um, most obviously, you know, varieties of, of machine learning or social network analysis, et cetera, you know, helping the public, but maybe even the private sector, finding the, you know, the proverbial needle in the haystack when it comes to terrorism financing? Um, or is the needle always going to be too small and the haystack always too big that, you know, no matter what sort of, you um, you know, machine learning algorithm we have or, or, or new technology, it's, it's still not going to be identified as we understand it in that way. I'm a little skeptical about sort of machine learning and counter-terrorist financing because the examples that I've seen and the examples that I've worked with produce interesting results, but I find that identifying and articulating the connection and the activity as terrorist financing can be really difficult. And so when you work in a judicial or quasi-judicial system where you have to be presenting evidence to a judge to get warrants and et cetera, et cetera, you have to be able to clearly explain how that connection was made, where the grounds of suspicion are. And to date, I have yet to see machine learning or algorithms that do that better than humans do. That being said, I'm not convinced that that's always going to be the case. I think that we may eventually get there, but I think that's going to be require a pretty deep partnership between experts in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and experts in counter-terrorist financing, and particularly in the investigation piece, because you really need to be able to prove that connection, that association, that link. And those are always red flag words for me when I when I see people say they're such and such a person is associated to this group. I always wonder, what does association mean in this context? Mm-hmm. Does it mean they once attended the same coffee shop or does it mean they're like actively working together to advance a plot? Because those are both associations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we've have, we have an interesting question from, from Raj Sandhu and um... He's, he's, he's asking about professional enablers. Obviously, this is, you know, the, the series of, um, you know, lawyers, accountants, or, or other sort of professions that, that are known in the anti-money laundering space to sort of support, um, you know, money laundering plots or how to otherwise hide or launder the, the criminal, criminal um, proceeds. Um, but do we see lots of sort of professional, um, professional enablers supporting terrorist groups or individuals to, to perhaps obscure their funds or, or, or to raise funds. Because I think in terrorism financing, we're always imagining terrorist financier come attacker at the same time. We kind of this one kind of idea of like a bad actor, but but is there room for a discussion around professional enablers in, in this space? I think this is one of the places where we need to be having a lot of conversation. Um, in my research, what I found was that there were not a lot of professional enablers. There were very few clear examples of accountants, of lawyers, of other sort of professionals involved in terrorist financing. However, it's also one of the places where I was a bit skeptical about my own findings because, <laughs> you know, I've worked in this in this business for a long time now, and I just hesitate a little bit with the certainty that they're not involved in in the terrorist financing space. And I suspect that there's a fair bit more evidence that, or there's a fair bit more activity that they are involved in either, maybe not ideologically, you know, maybe they're just providing professional services and they don't really care who their clients are. Some of them may be ideologically motivated as well, but I think this is a kind of place where we need to be paying a lot more attention. We need to be doing a lot more research and analysis. And I, and I mean that both in the unclassified space, but also for practitioners working in the classified space. Mm-hmm. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that I think we've seen certain kind of aspects of terrorism financing, you know, 
is everybody that gets involved in a plot, you know, knowingly in getting them, do they know that they're getting involved in a terrorist plot? Do they know that this person is a terrorist or just a sort of petty criminal or some other kind of member of an organized crime group? It's it's not always clear. We think about terrorism, I think we sort of can have a tendency to overemphasize the idea, everyone's ideologically motivated piece here. So I agree, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. It's something we could look into more. Um, I've got one minute left, but I'm hoping to throw one more question to you, Jessica, if that's okay. Um, it comes from, from Chris Rogers. Chris asks, to what extent has your work found kind of useful opportunities for disrupting terrorism financing at the intersection uh, with the detection or, or prosecution or sort of you know, post-sentencing enforcement of, of, of ordinary criminality? So again, I think that speaks a little bit to what we were saying about ordinary criminals um, and their perhaps potential to have a nexus with terrorism or terrorism financing uh, after they've kind of entered the and entered that system, is this is is this something? This kind of seems to be in the the kind of lone actor or self activator space. But um, but but what is what is your work found about, around this? Yeah, I think you know it's a bit of a difficult question. So I think that there's a couple of things. I think that you know the intersection between terrorism and criminality is an interesting one um, in terms of how often it's used, particularly for financing plots and and attacks. Um, in terms of using it as a disruption activity, I think that that's obviously a really great opportunity that if you have evidence of criminal activity that you can you can easily disrupt the activity if you have if you can make those charges stick. The difficult thing then is for researchers and national level organizations who need to prove that it was a terrorist plot that they disrupted based on a criminal charge of another type. So I think that we need to do some work in that space because we're maybe not capturing, all of the, those disruption opportunities or using them to their fullest extent. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. And actually all the time we have for today, Jessica, thanks so much for choosing to, you know, to launch your book with the CFCS at RUSI. Um, we're really excited for you and congratulations on the publication. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you so much to CFCS for hosting this. It was a really great opportunity. Yeah, it was a really interesting discussion. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, and, and to our audience, you know, if anyone is interested in purchasing a copy of Illicit Money, do watch your inbox over the next couple of, day, couple of days uh, from an email from the events team at RUSI, because we are going to be sharing a discount code with you uh, for everybody who attended the event today. Uh, it's going to be a 20% discount available until the end of November. So do keep an eye out for that. Very exciting stuff. Uh, anybody who wants to know more about the CFCS or you want to follow our publications, our podcasts, or our events, um, I can direct you to rusi.org slash CFCS. There you can sign up for our newsletter, uh, but you're also welcome to follow us on social media channels if you want more frequent and immediate updates on all of our work. I just want to quickly say thanks to the Rusi events team, but also to Olivia Kearney for their behind the scenes support of this virtual book launch. And thanks once again to everybody for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you very soon.